come out for this event who probably know your biography. Uh, I don't so well. Uh, and I know you went to school here at the University of Mississippi and went to the medical uh, school in uh, Jackson and uh, presently at the Vanderbilt uh, Hospital and uh, in the, the uh, areas in, in which he is a professor, of which he is a professor, uh, there at the uh, hospital are numerous and hard to pronounce. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see. <laughs> Neurological surgery, pediatrics, plastic surgery, radiology, and I'm sure if you've got some other kind of ailment, you can fix it. <laughs> um, but Jay, thank you for this book, and uh, thank you for coming here, and congratulations. Let's welcome Jay Welcome. Thank you, Richard. It's uh, fantastic to be here. Uh, I've already told as many people as I can that my mind is blowing right now. Um, you know, I was graduated from Ole Miss, um, my gosh, back in 1991. And, uh, you know, Square Books was really my first bookstore. Um, I'm fortunate to live in Nashville. I'm fortunate to uh, uh, have a wonderful bookstore there at Parnassus. Uh, and um, I'm also quite fortunate to have as my writing sensei, uh, Ann Patchett. And before I hit the road, she said to me, you make sure that you appreciate every one of these independent bookstores. You grew up with Square Books, you grew up with Lemuria, and you're living in a town with Parnassus. So there's not these kind of stores in the rest of the country. And so um, we're lucky to have this place here. We're lucky to have these amazing independent bookstores that we do. But we're really grateful for what you've done. I know you've done it. This institution's done a lot for this community, uh, but just in general, what literature brings. Um, and, um, you know, I can say as somebody who's spent the last uh, 25 or so years firmly in my left brain, which is kind of the dominant center, uh, which is the place of science and math and so forth, and then over the last few years to have kind of flipped over into my right brain, which is the area of creativity, um, I can just say that uh, these places are absolutely critical. So thank you for that, and thank you for having me here. Also, will absolutely catch grief for the rest of my life if I'm sitting in square books and I do not recognize my sister, Sarah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this was also her bookstore. And uh, I think this is probably why she poked on me to write a book so that we could both be in this store one day. <laughs> but uh, my aunt and uncle are here, good friends, Monty and William Henderson and Ollie Rencher are here, and also, um, hopefully, if you guys have a chance to read the book, um, you'll see that um, all of this in the book is um, nonfiction. It all happened. It's real. There's one section that did not, and so there's actually two authors in the book. You know, one is myself, who wrote the the nonfiction aspect, but um, but uh, my daughter Farewell, is, who's here, uh, wrote the uh, the actual fiction part that's in one of the chapters here. So. I'd just like to recognize her as an up-and-coming author. <laughs> and um, so um, I'm going to just kind of pivot a little bit here uh, because I do want to read from the book, uh, and you'll understand why I want to read this particular story uh, in a moment. But I do want to just talk a little bit about the book itself, All That Moves Us. Um, you know, I believe that we all have stories to tell. I believe that, um, that everybody's life is a journey, and we can learn something from everybody around us. It doesn't need to be in the neurosurgical OR. Uh, it doesn't need to be in a hospital. But I will tell you that if you want to find a place where there are miracles asked for, and miracles answered, and prayers, and difficult times, and grief, and joy, and resilience, and grace, uh, you really just need to walk through the cafeteria of any hospital, uh, because you know, all of us uh, will have those journeys in our lives. And, um, and uh, you know, Richard kind of mentioned that uh, I have some titles. I mean, you know, you kind of can't be in academic medicine without kind of getting titles thrust upon you um, at some point. Um, so, you know, I, um, I, you know, as I mentioned, I, I was here for college. I went to the medical school at University of Mississippi with, uh, graduated with William Henderson back there. And, Dennis's and just a, a great education. I went to Duke uh, for my residency, 
Uh, those were the days before there were work hour limitations. Believe it or not, now you're not supposed to work more than 80 hours a week. Well, <laughs> back in those days, you know, they called us residents because we were residents of the hospital. <laughs> Which I think is probably what saved my marriage when I think about it. That's probably why Melissa didn't leave me because she didn't have to spend that much time with me. <laughs> um, but, uh, but then after Duke, I went to do a one-year fellowship in pediatric neurosurgery uh, at University of Alabama, Birmingham, which at the time just had a terrific program and a wonderful mentor, and I uh, ended up staying on faculty. I was there originally for one year, but I stayed 10. I used to say it took me 10 years to get my fellowship certificate, but the reality of it is is I just had a terrific career there, and, and we're very grateful for that community. Um, and I had the opportunity to move to Vanderbilt for some leadership positions, and over the first five years there, really, you know, had you know, become vice chairman of the department, was division chief, uh, was program director for the residency program, which for those of us in medicine knows that you're basically running the residency program. So in neurosurgery, it's a seven-year commitment, uh, plus any other time you do for extra training that's on top of medical school. And, um, and so really, I was going Mach 9. And uh, over the course of that time, I also was... Um, very active clinically and in the research world too, uh, but you know clinically the number of times I had, you know back in the old days showed a film on a light box to a couple sitting in a in a room either in the emergency room or or in the clinic or, or nowadays scroll through on a computer screen, you know kind of looking at the at the brain of their child and you know whether it showed an injury from a car accident or or a brain tumor. Uh, you know, a discussion about well, this is a tumor and this is what we're going to need to do and you know you can just see the realization wash over the family's face it's, it's a conversation that, that nobody really wants to have um, but in 2017 uh, instead of me saying those words it was me hearing those words um, so I had a, a tumor that was in the top part of the back muscles of my leg um, that was about the size of a, of a tennis ball um, and I have to have surgery to take it out. And it was really thought to be malignant. Um, so there was a wide resection done and then ultimately proved to be benign. Literally like a one out of a million chance. I, like I made the pathologist show me in the textbook, you know, like where it was benign. Um, but, but I was on bed rest for about two and a half months after that. And so, you know, I was going Mach 9 uh, and all of a sudden I was still. And, um, you know, I'll tell you guys, there's like only so much Netflix you can watch. <laughs> um, and so back to my sister, Sarah, who um, is the person who said, you know, all these stories you've been telling us, you ought to write some of these things down. And so I literally just sat down and started writing just one or two words or sentences, reminder stories, you know, the fish hook guy or, um, you know, the lady with the splenic artery, artery aneurysm. You know, just something to trigger my memory because there's a lot that, that you know, you have in there after, you know, 30 years in medicine. Um, plus, uh, 20 years before that, being from Mississippi, I had a lot in there too. I kind of have to ramp that down, as you guys know, so we can get other people outside the state to believe it. Um, but, um, but really, it was from that um, that uh, a, couple of, a couple of pieces came that end up running in the New York Times. And I'm going to read one of them, uh, not, and I do want to get to Q&A, but I, I do want to read one of them, and that'll be clear in mind just a minute. Um, but, um, but after that, uh, it turns out that my editor at the Times was a guy named Peter Catapano. And unbeknownst to me, Peter, his shtick was finding new writers. Okay? So after the first one that came out, it was kind of a funny story. He said, you know, you're a pediatric neurosurgeon. I bet you got something serious. Why don't you write something serious? So... I wrote this other story that I'm going to read. And, uh, and after that second piece came out, I started getting um, uh, phone calls from people all around the world. And it was right as the pandemic was starting to come out. And it was right when we realized that, um, that hope was something that we needed. Um, and um, it, was, it was really this story that, uh, that triggered the book. And so I'd like just to, just to pivot for a minute and read that. It will take about you know, eight minutes or so. And then I'll talk a little bit more, and then maybe we'll get to some questions or so. And uh, Sarah, you can't ask any questions. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I do want folks to know that, you know, my goal was not to write a book that's like, hey, you know, I'm the best neurosurgeon ever. Come see me. That is not it. Those books have been written time and time again. 
this book. to establish your lens of some of Anne's early you know, advice like you got to get your lens like what do you want people to be reading these stories through so I'm very grateful for that I've been mentored very well in, in the writing world I'm so grateful for that um, but so so mainly it's about the kids that have had such an impact on me and, and people around them just like it says on the cover like resilience and grace they're just They've helped me move through some of the challenging times in my life. We are not immune to suffering, and we are not immune to grief. And I think we know that now, after these last two years. Uh, but if you just just look at the kids and look at what they're able to move through, and that, that conversation that you have with the families beforehand, how it just turns to this sense of community. Uh, it's just a remarkable thing. So, I'm going to read a story entitled, uh, 90 Minutes from You by Brown. On a blustery, rainy Saturday in my first year of practice, I went to my office after rounds, put my feet up on my desk, took a sip of lukewarm coffee, and leaned back in my chair to relax after a busy morning. Within seconds, I felt a pager clip to my belt vibrate. I set my mug down on the desk and called the number back. An emergency room doctor from another hospital immediately picked up and identified himself. Doc, said a clip voice, we got a nine-year-old girl here who was a rear passenger in a two-car collision about two hours ago. She's just arrived. The scan shows a three centimeter subdural hematoma on the right side of her brain. We're a small show. Can you take her? Yes, I said immediately. What's her exam? Her right pupil's blown and she's posturing on the left. The pupil typically dilates on the side of the brain with the increased pressure, in this case, the right side, as the brain is forced down and away from the blood clot. The nerve responsible for pupillary function basically goes haywire and starts to enlarge in response. The term posturing describes a movement pattern that comes from damage being done to the part of the brain that deals with movement. Both are outward signs of high brain pressure. Put bluntly, this girl was sick, getting sicker quickly, and the window to save her was closing. Why don't you already have her in the air, I asked, slightly annoyed. My hospital at the time was in Birmingham, Alabama. Theirs was in Auburn, 100 miles away. A medical helicopter could have her here in just over 30 minutes, well within the window to save her. Weather's too bad between Auburn and Birmingham to fly in. She's 90 minutes from you by ground, at least, he said, clearly knowing what that meant. An hour and a half in an ambulance, plus the two hours since her accident, is a long time to have high intracranial pressure and expect a patient to survive. What do we do now, he asked. Even now, when I'm faced with a situation without an obvious solution, my mind goes to my father and the calmness I felt flying next to him as a child. During his more than four decades of service in the Air National Guard, he piloted all types of planes in all types of situations and weather. Early on, he taught me to review the flight checklist before every takeoff and landing. Once aloft, we would practice emergencies in the air. As we would gain altitude and I would be focused on keeping the plane level on the horizon or interpreting the navigation system, he would quietly feather the props the tiniest amount or trim the flaps just so. Then, as we gently lost airspeed and the altimeter would slowly begin to wind down under his watchful eye, he would have me work the problem until I had it figured out. Flying and problem solving for him went hand in hand and were as much a part of him as breathing. As the brief memory faded, I found myself staring at the worn photo of him that sat on my office desk. He's standing next to an F-4 Phantom, helmet under his arm, grinning wildly in his olive drab Na National Guard flight suit. Are those Black Hawk helicopters still stationed at that base near you? I asked the emergency room doctor. Yes, but he trailed off and he was back. Yes, those guys will fly in anything. You get the Black Hawks, I'll let the operating room know. My office overlooked the street in front of the hospital. After half an hour, I looked down to see the surface of the coffee in my mug, rippling like the scene in Jurassic Park, where the approaching T-Rex's footsteps are detected in puddles of water. Within seconds, there were rhythmic pulsations all around, then a strong thump, 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 thump as the air beat against my window. Outside, in the midst of the downpour, trash cans tumbled down the street, and pickup trucks were forced down on their shocks. I gazed up to see an Army Black Hawk helicopter, giant in comparison to our standard medical helicopters, hovering steadily over the children's hospital helipad. Rain and fog swirling in all directions. Every part of the office thumped 
the heartbeat of my own chest now overpowered. Events moved quickly after the girl's arrival. In the pediatric trauma bay, two of the soldiers who brought her through the storm, still in their wet flight gear, worked alongside our nurses. As I came to the bedside, one of the nurses greeted me by name, and the younger of the two soldiers, for some inexplicable reason, immediately snapped to attention. A vision of my father in his flight suit flashed in my head. At ease, soldier, I said, I should be saluting you. As we packaged the child up and headed off to the elevator, up to the operating room, I turned back to them. There they stood, amidst the residual chaos of the trauma room, torn paper packaging and discarded blue gowns strewn about. They watched us roll into the elevator. I locked eyes with the closest soldier. He gave the briefest of nods just before the doors closed. Then he and the chaos of the trauma bay were gone. The OR team was ready for her. The sterile instruments laid out on the back table, blue drapes applied after a quick clipping of her hair and lightning fast wash of her head with sterilizing prep solution. In life-saving operations like this, as the clock has ticked past zero, the typical precision of neurosurgery loses out to speed, speed at all costs. Knife, no damn it, we can stop the skin bleeding later. Retractor, drill, scissors to open the dura, bulging and tight from the underlying blood. The liquid part of the clot jets out around the scissors as we cut. Once the brain is exposed, it does the work for us, extruding most of the solid coagulated clot out in a matter of seconds. We clean out what is left at the edges, and I see the offending vein torn away from the brain during the accident. We coagulate it and begin to make our way out, step by step, gently repairing all that we had to take apart to get there. After surgery, she immediately began to stabilize, waking up and even flickering her eyes open. But her recovery took time, and her journey was not without cost. She was left with a noticeable weakness on the left side and the slightest stir slur to her speech, but she was alive. With each follow-up appointment, some hurdle had been overcome. Over time, I would receive updates from her family. She would come to enter and then win a local beauty and talent pageant, be voted most school spirit, cheer alongside friends dressed up as the school mascot, and then one remarkable May Day graduate from high school. Four years later, she would finish college and head to graduate school for a career in social work. All of this chronicled first in clinic visits, then as the medical reasons to see me faded in holiday cards and the occasional letter. A decade and a half after her injury, I received one such letter. No longer the hand-drawn cards of childhood or newspaper clippings from her proud parents. This was a handwritten note on elegant stationery inviting me to her wedding. Her wedding. I could still see her in the bed of the pediatric ICU after surgery, a nine-year-old child with abrasions on the side of her face from the accident and a clean white head wrap around her head. The nurses methodically connecting her to the monitors, line by line, two by two, me urging her to squeeze my hand for a sign, any sign that she was better. Now, years later, I was reading how thankful she was to have been given this chance, grateful for those soldiers in that helicopter, for the two hospital teams, and for me. She promised to always have us in mind as she began her new married life, and hopefully one day raised her own family. As I read the letter sitting in a different office in a different city, thinking back over those events, I found myself realizing how deeply grateful I was for her evolving story over the years. All the cards, each barrier broken, every milestone, and for what that experience taught me. So many other critically ill children in the subsequent years benefited from this early experience when I was learning how hard to push, where to draw the line, and how much to expect of others. My father's lessons in the air, that industrious emergency room doctor, those brave soldiers soaked to the bone, standing there as we rolled away. So many people and events came together for this one child to grow into her life, to find happiness and to find love. All of us need a living, breathing reminder to just keep pushing on, there may be a life there to be beautifully and fully lived, a person who needs someone, anyone, to work the problem, to make the hard call, and to fly in a storm. The reason <laughs> the reason that I'm so particularly emotional now is because it's the first time that I've ever had the opportunity to read it to that patient. Jensen, thank you for coming. It's such an honor to have you here.
so this is Jensen Jones Anderson. That's her husband Ed, and they have come over. And thank you so much for coming, Jensen. It's really an honor to have you here. And thank you for being a part of this. I mean, you have really inspired hope across the southeast and, and beyond. So thank you for being here. Yeah. Um, okay. So uh, we're done. See you guys later. No, um, so I do want to. I do want to take questions because I think um, you know the times I got that I've been to author events. You know, I'm the guy that keeps asking questions. So, um, so if anybody has any questions, I'm I'm happy to, to take those. Or if you have questions for Jensen, I'm sure she's happy. <laughs> What's the biggest changes in neurosurgery since you started 30 years ago? Oh gosh. Well, that's a great question. I would say. Um, you know, it's really neat uh, <clears throat> that neurosurgery is such a field where there has been a just technological explosion, right? Um, you know, back when I started, like, I realized that um, I kind of see myself as the Hawkeye Pierce of pediatric neurosurgery. <laughs> you know, like, I really I feel like I know what I know, and I know what I don't know, right? And uh, I've got these three amazing young partners that I work with, and they all are so so talented, and they are so engaged in their field. And um, and honestly, the thing that I think is the is the biggest difference is the advent of robotic surgery for implantation of electrodes. Like we are finding so much out about the brain now, and about you know just like implantation of electrodes for Parkinson's. Well, that's not something that we do in pediatric neurosurgery, but our adult functional neurosurgery colleagues saw improvement in cognition in patients that had early onset dementia or saw people that had obsessive compulsive disorder begin, that began to back off, or people that had certain seizure types begin to be affected by this deep implantation. So, you know, so neurosurgeons, we kind of deal with the outer anatomy of the brain, you know, kind of like, uh, you know, um, all the Isaac Asimov, Incredible Voyage, the two books that he wrote about, you know, getting small and taking stuff out of the brain. But it's really this, this understanding of this neural network that, that we're getting because of the ability that robotic surgery has given us to put these tiny probes in places with really hardly even disturbing them. I mean, sub one millimeter size probes. And, you know, to see my partner do it, Rob Naftal, is a good Birmingham guy that he just, he's so good at it. And to see the effect that he can have on kids. And now what we're learning about how to treat other, you know, other issues. Like, I'm really excited about uh, some of these studies that are getting started at various medical centers to help people that have obsessive compulsive disorder or addiction. You know, you can you can target the cingulate gyrus for people that have obsessive compulsive disorder or the nucleus accumbens septi, which is in the prefrontal cortex, to help people that have addiction problems. And it looked like it may make a difference. So that's really exciting for me. So I, I think I get to I get to kind of be the you know, kind of the older guy who brought the really awesome guys in and kind of be proud. Like, I'm kind of proud of this guy. You know, but, but, in, but I'm still the, you know, the, you know, Alan Alma guy. Okay. Yes, ma'am. So with obsessive compulsive disorder and addiction disorders, are there any uh, references you can give us in order to access what you have to, um, or resources yeah. to there's a um, the early studies are done by Dr. Lozano up at University of Toronto okay. and those are the earliest papers that have been written and um, we've have just hired a new assistant say again? I'm sorry I didn't no no and uh, we just you know this is not like a commercial for Vanderbilt or anything but we just <laughs> hired a, a new assistant <laughs> professor to run some trials in the in the psychiatry world for this very reason but if you if you look up if you go to Medline and look up um, Lozano in Toronto, Canada, and look up uh, deep brain stimulation, that's really where the earliest work was done. And also, I'm sorry, on a second note, the TBIs. If, <clears throat> for instance, I have a very good friend with the TBI, um, got hit on the side of the road, unfortunate incident. Um, <clears throat> after two years. She Well, why don't, why don't you catch me afterwards and we can talk about it? Because there are some things in TBI that you can do. Oftentimes, recovery is plateaued by then. Uh, but 
but uh, but there are some things that can be looked at. So I'm happy to talk to you about that. You bet. Okay. Yes, sir. Uh, the surgery you were talking about doing in uh, the fetuses. Yes, sir. For the um, spinal bifida. That, does that completely cure that condition? So that's a great question. The question is about surgery for spina bifida. So um, spina bifida is where the spinal cord doesn't form all the way in utero. It happens in the first month of pregnancy, oftentimes before we would even know. That's why, that's why myself and Dr. Henderson in the back and his OBGYN partners all get people of childbearing age to take folate because it reduces the incidence of neural tube defects. And so this, this issue is that if the spinal cord doesn't roll all the way up early on, then the body forms, but the legs don't work, and the bladder doesn't work, and the bowel doesn't work, and other things like hydrocephalus, where spinal fluid gets backed up in the brain. It can be really um, the, the difficult journey for kids. And so forever, as you know, for the first 10 years of my career in Birmingham, I, I think I closed like 500 back <coughs> myelomeningocytes just in, within the first 72 hours after, after birth. Uh, and then the, you know, the child would have whatever sequela they would have either not being able to walk or ambulate, um, which I know is the same thing, William, but not being able to move their legs, uh, but also uh, just sorting through hydrocephalus, which is this water on the brain. Now, uh, part of the reason why I moved from a really great, happy, awesome practice in Birmingham with great partners to a new opportunity in Nashville at Vanderbilt was to learn from a man by the name of Noel Tulipan. And Noel, at the time, his entire career was about fetal neurosurgery. So I'll talk about that a little bit because I think it's fascinating. So much, in fact, that I know my sister will probably go to sleep. But, um, <laughs> but the point is, is that like if you like, I used to tell my residents, if you want to look at somebody who has walked down a problem, look at this man's curriculum vitae. He started with animal models. He went to case reports. He did studies. He did case control studies, epidemiology out the wazoo, and then he partnered with two other institutions and the NIH had a $26.5 million study where they randomized between fetal surgery versus postnatal surgery. And it turns out the study had to be halted. And those of us that were naysayers said, aha, they had to halt the study because there was a problem with fetal surgery. And it turns out they had to halt the study because it was so positive that if they would have continued the study, it would have been unethical. And so that's into the environment that I came into uh, to Vanderbilt to learn from the man who had done, I used to say, the most of these in the known galaxy. And, um, and the neat thing about what Noel's attitude was was that a couple of the other places um, were not as uh, robust about their willingness to educate. But Noel's attitude was like, yeah, you can come watch us do it, and, uh, and we'll take you out to dinner. And so what happened is into this environment of multiple centers coming to, to learn how to do it, I came into that. And then Noel pretty quickly retired and, 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 and passed away. But I, I do feel like that one of the ways I can honor him is make sure in situations like this I can say his name because of the impact that he's had on so many kids. So without going too deep into it, I talk about it in the book. Uh, we were asked to come over to Australia to help them do the first fetal surgery in Australia. And uh, you know, doing fetal surgery is not just like one guy coming in and closing the back. I mean, there's a huge team. And it's really all about the MFM, the OBGYN doctors. You know, there's not a part of their residency where they train to open the uterus and close it and keep the fetus in it, let the bread stay in the oven, right? And so there's this amazing process that they do. There's 15 people in the OR, and we come in as the pediatric neurosurgery team with our little micro instruments and we close the back, but really the rest of the heavy, the heavy lifting is done by the maternal fetal medicine team. So we go to, um, so we have this team of seven of us that do it at Vanderbilt. And we've taught other centers around North America and Canada to do it. So then we go over to Australia, where they have their team of seven. So it's this real meta experience where our teams all line up in the OR, and we're all discombobulated. It's 12 hours, 13 hours difference. And we basically did a simulation where they had a whole OR. They had a fake patient, they had a little baby, they had a half <laughs> had a half basketball we were supposed to open and had a little baby in there and the anesthesia would call out blood pressure problems. It was just like the stuff that I would do with my dad. Like, it was amazing. And so here we are, you know, running through these simulations and then the next day we meet the family and it's this, this wonderful young couple. I still remember her. She had, you know, she had her hijab on and her and her husband were just such wonderfully spiritual people and they you know, they elected to move forward with it, and, and we did the surgery. 
And you know, at the time, you know, with our the spinal cord, you know, it's like three grains of rice. That's how small it is. And you have these micro instruments and these magnifying glasses on. And the nurse, you know, kind of hands me the instrument to close it. And I'm like, no, it's not ours to do. It's it's my Australian counterparts to do. So he's doing it, and I'm kind of assisting him. And he gets the last stitch in. And you know, there are 50 people in this operating room. And it's on a Sunday, and they put closed caption TVs in all the other ORs so that people could watch people in the hospital. They just, they just wanted to be there. They just wanted to be a part of it, right? They just wanted to, to touch the room. It was remarkable. And so there he is. He's putting the last little stitch in with his micro instruments. The sutures, it's as small as human hair. If it gets caught in the air currents, it blows away. And with this last stitch, I leaned over and I said, let the record show that the first you know, fetal surgery was done by an Australian fetal surgeon. And it was just this remarkable feeling of that we had done something uh, that was just uncanny. And, uh, you know, and the eyes of Australia were upon us. And so it's a really, you know, I think at the time, um, you don't realize sometimes when you have these remarkable moments in your career, but that was a remarkable moment in my career. And, uh, and there's a couple of stories about fetal surgery in there because it's certainly, one of the horizons, too. Yes, sir. What are the uh, academic neurosurgeons doing to help their residents learn how to operate since uh, you and I both yeah. see one, do one, teach one? And yeah, that's the learned, title of that chapter. Yeah. Yeah, no, and we learned how. Yeah. And now, where they are required by law to only work. You don't learn how to operate like that. Well, it's, you know, it's interesting because, um, you know, I learned like you, where um, any time of the day you got called. You know, I, I, it's, um, it wasn't until their son, Will, read the book that he forgave me for not being present for some of the larger moments of his life <laughs> because he realized that I was out of pocket for seven years. I mean, you, you remember that. Um, so... Then I pivoted to being in charge of the program and being in charge of having to enforce the work hours. And so, you know, I think what you want in training residents now is you want them to want to be there. You want them to be like, boss, I'll stay, don't worry about it. And you want to have to send them home, uh, as painful as that is. Because, you know, working 130 hours a week, I ran into the same tree twice on the way home after midnight. <laughs> same tree, like two nights in a row. So I think I think there's a balance between um, between what work they're doing and I think what the key work is. And I think that's the key. I, th I think that's the trick. The, the difficult, the razor's edge. You know, the good Somerset Maugham uh, book to walk is to figure out what it is they need to be doing to learn their craft. What we did in neurosurgery, we immediately increased the residency by a year to make sure their case volume is the same. And, um, and I can tell you that, that the residents that we're finishing now at Vanderbilt and the ones that when I was at UAB and the most folks that I know, they're getting adequate training. Um, it's, just, it's just a different environment. And I know it's hard for us as the older generation surgeons like, I remember falling asleep when I was operating. Well, is that a good thing? I don't know. <laughs> but at the same time, like what everybody wants is they want they want the neurosurgeon who can do it with his eyes closed. They want the person, the surgeon who who did it so many times they can do it rote, right? Who can take out an appendix without thinking about it, who can, you know, do an emergency hysterectomy, who can do all these things. They've just done it so many times. But at the but at the end of the day, the law spoke. And so, you know, it, it began with uh, the Libby Zion case in New York, as I'm sure you know, and it ratcheted from there. But I mean, I could talk about this forever until everybody's asleep. But it is, it is a fast because so because I was in charge of it. Yeah. All right. Any other questions? Yes, ma'am, in the back. Thanks for coming. I'm halfway through, and it's great. I love it. So congratulations. Thank you. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that.
Well, I'd say uh, 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 in, a, in a recent uh, New Yorker piece that, that came out that, um, when my name was mentioned, I was like, I think my name was mentioned in the same sentence as Chekhov. I was like, this is not, this is not no one close to that. Chekhov is amazing. <laughs> and probably it was amazing. But I'd say the most influence on me um, was a guy by the name of John Stone. He was a cardiologist at Emory. And when I was a first year medical student, I went to medical school. I was an English major here. You know, I, I was sat in classes with Barry Hanna and Ellen Douglas and, you know, amazing teachers. Chris Fitter and, and, and you know, um, Colby Coleman and um, Ann Fisherworth and, I mean, you know, Greg Shermer. These are just remarkable teachers and writers. And I basically went to medical school to just learn about the human condition and be a family medicine doctor move back to South Mississippi and get paid in chickens. I'm not kidding, that's really what I wanted to do. You know, and then all of a sudden you go to the anatomy lab and you realize how much you love the anatomy and you just kind of lay all that down at the altar of neurosurgery and 30 years later. But I remember as a first year medical student in the cadaver lab, I was trying to figure out what I wanted to do. And they said there's an author downstairs that the medical center's asked to come in and give a talk and he signed his book. It was John Stone. And it was a book called The Country of Hearts. And I tell you, I think it's a wonderful book. And uh, there's a lot of books that I recommend now of writers current. Um, but, but that's the book I go back in the past and recommend. Because it's about, it's about the concept of the difference between the literal and the metaphorical heart. And there's a piece of John Stone's book in here. It just is. Just uh, there's a, that influence 30 years later is in this book. I, I just... Um, I even write a little bit about the difference between the literal and the metaphorical brain. Mm. Um, so I would say John Stone, big one. Uh, and I love Feral Sam's, you know, when all the world is young. That's just amazing writing to me. Um, so those are the two main ones that I would, I would go back in the past. If I was going to recommend a book not from a doctor, I feel like, I mean, Mary Laura Philippot's recent book called Bomb Shelter, like I know her pretty well uh, just from being in Nashville, and she and Margaret Rinkle and Anne have been amazing writing mentors for me. But Mary Laura Philpott's book is the, it's like the perspective of what it's like to be a parent when your child is sick. And she writes about when her woke up one morning her, her teenage child was having a grand mal seizure and just kind of what that was like. Sometimes in my best days, because I think her writing is so amazing, I feel like maybe our books are like book books. <laughs> uh, I'm in a receptor because this is like what it's like to be a doctor to take care of people's kids and Mary Laura's book is what it's like to be a child I mean to be a parent of a child who's having a problem and have somebody come in and have this conversation that nobody wants to have and yet this community that comes later yes. where are they doing the most research on um, the um, oh God, the brain is just Yeah, yeah, Parkinson's. Yeah, well, I, I, I knew it, it would come yeah. eventually. <laughs> Not with any help well, my wife. Yeah. <laughs> Whenever I do that, my wife actually is happy. She's like, ha, 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 I'm not helping you. And I can say that because she's not here right now. Uh, yeah. I don't tell her I said You'll that. live. Um, but, uh, you know, the Fox Foundation, um, remarkable. Um, and also, Christopher Reeves, Spinal Cord Injury Foundation, remarkable. And what's what I think is important, you know, my dad died of Lou Gehrig's disease. That's uh, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, you know, that's an awful disease to have. Uh, but so is Parkinson's. So is Alzheimer's. Neurodegenerative disease is, is you know, this is, the, this is the decade. We're figuring out, you know, my, one of my closest friends from residency at Duke is now the chairman of cardiac surgery at Vanderbilt. So it's great to circle back with him. A guy named Oz Shaw. He can transplant a heart into about anybody. He can do a cabbage, a coronary artery bypass. He's a remarkable surgeon, but he agrees that now we're getting people to live longer with diabetes. We're getting people to live longer with spina bifida. We're getting people to live longer with just about anything. And now they're living into an age where their mind starts to change, and that's hard. And so I'm a huge proponent, even though I'm a pediatric neurosurgeon, I'm a huge proponent of us trying to understand how 
to reverse some of these effects. And things like the Fox Foundation and Christopher Reeve Foundation, and frankly, the NIH. You know, I've, I've, I've cast my lot upon the NIH for grants multiple times and been fortunate enough to have a few unfunded. For Corey, like the government does do a good job of understanding what needs to be funded. So I think sometimes we don't get a good job of getting the message out. But the CORI, the NIH, the NICHD, the NINDS, I know these are all a bunch of letters. But the bottom line is, is that I do think they do a good job of parsing out grants. And I do think foundations like the Fox Foundation and Christopher Reeves Foundations are doing the right thing with their money. They're not putting a bunch of it into support. They're putting it into the hands of the investigators so that they can figure out the solutions to the problem. Uh, that's great. Thanks. You bet. So, like most doctors, you're too busy to take care of yourselves. How was your tumor button? Oh, yeah. So, um, I was doing yoga, and uh, I was like, yeah, what is this? What is this? Oh, what this is? And I just blew it off, you know? And then, um, and then it started pushing against my sciatic nerve, which is this nerve that I'm operating. It's this huge nerve, like the size of your thumb, that goes down the back of your leg. You know, heard of somebody having sciatica? Like, my sciatica hurt. But this was actually on the nerve. And I've operated on that nerve, I don't know, 100 times. You just don't think about it, right? But I, I write about this one girl in the book, um, in actually the chapter that's called The Brain and All the Moves Her name is Hannah. And uh, Hannah had a tumor in near her basal ganglia, which is the basal ganglia is the part of the brain that helps us coordinate, helps us move. really important tiny little blood vessel in it, and I'll, I'll let you read about it. But I actually took my cue from her, uh, and because uh, I had watched her move through this extraordinary journey to now where she's in college, and you know I see her Instagram account now. I mean, it's remarkable, this life she's living. But I, I, I decided to go with an underworld motif, and I named, I named my tumor Wormwood. <laughs> <laughs> because in C.S. Lewis's book, in the screw tape letters, you know, Wormwood's design was to bring about the fall of man. And so I was like, you're not going to bring about the fall of this man. And I wrote it on a tennis ball, and I put it in the corner of the room while I was learning how to walk again so that I could, you know, keep pushing me. So, so that's the story of the tumor. You know. Yes, sir. Is there, are you academics... Uh Doing anything, is there any hope on the glioblastoma? Yeah, the glioblastoma most formed. Yeah, I'm glad you asked that question. Astrocytoma um, Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, um, uh, five days ago was glioblastoma multiforme awareness day. And uh, I was in Atlanta and uh, working, like doing a reading that was in association with the Carter Center. And I read um, a story about Delayla. It was a little six-year-old girl who came in blind, and um, she had a giant tumor that we took out in a five-hour kind of urgent operation. And she woke up being able to see, but the, the tumor was a GBM, so that's a grade four malignant tumor. And um, I write about her journey over the next year and a half or so, and then how she ultimately passed away. Um, but, um, but, you know, it's like suffering and grief. You know, it doesn't matter if you're, if you're Ted Kennedy, it doesn't matter if you're John McCain. You know, these are great men that have served their country that both died of the GBM, not too far apart. And uh, it's a terrible disease. And um, that uh, is, is one of the things that, you know, we can take it out with an operation that takes five hours or 12 hours, and we can use our microscopes and our robots and our micro instruments. But at the end of the day, it's going to be the same type of stuff that's funding the research to know what the next step is. Is it a genetic issue? Is it a, is it a ribosomal issue? Is it a connectosomal issue? What's going to be the way to treat it? And, you know, there's good people at UAB, a guy by the name of Jim Marker, um, who was my chairman at UAB, who's looking at viral vectors. Alan Friedman was my chairman at Duke, and he's got a, looking at monoclonal antibodies. There's all kinds of studies that are ongoing, but it is an elusive beast. And, um, and I tell you, I, uh, my heart goes out to families and to patients that have the diagnosis because it's hard and, um, and it, we need help. Yeah, I have two doctor friends that refused any treatment because they knew this yes, was a kiss of death. Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah it's, um, you know, I write a little bit about what it's like to be a nurse surgeon and raise children and have families. And it's a little bit about like having a Pandora's box, you know, when you, you see these things. Um, and, uh, 
you know, the, uh, you know, the nightmare is seeing your child, you know, in the trauma bay, or seeing your wife, you know, with a, with a scan coming across that looks like the GBM. So it's a tough thing. Yes, yes ma'am. What advice would you give to someone just beginning their journey in medical school and in the medical field? Okay, great. That's a great question. Um, so young pet one. Where, where to begin? <laughs> um, first of all, I would say it's tremendous the importance of reflection. And you would say, well, why are you telling me reflection? I'm at the beginning. Um, I am so grateful for the little notes and jots down that I did when I was in medical school about things that I thought were important. I think that might have been just a little bit of the English major and be like, don't forget me! You know, like, like, don't forget that this stuff's important. And not just to write it down one day, but, you know, I mean, <laughs> I can remember so many patients I've cared for over the years and what they taught me really about grace and resilience. I mean, I, I remember the first woman I ever, you know, did a neurologic exam on, you know, in the hospital. <laughs> it took me two hours to do it. She said, I'm going to leave AMA if you don't get this done. <laughs> I mean, I just, I, I just think... The opportunity to, to move through it in a thoughtful way where you are engaged with your patients and remember that they are all more than a story. Um, and then at some point in the future, reflect at some point. Take time. You could be forced to like I was, or you could take the time, have it like at 15 years I'm going to reflect, at 20 years I'm going to but I just think it's so important um, to do that. It has been a remarkable journey of wellness for me, um, you know, just in terms of the challenges that we all have, like we talked about. Well, it has been a tremendous honor for me to be here at Square Books. Um, my 17-year-old self is like in my brain right now going, Dude, you're just at square points. <laughs> <laughs>